Poverty is not just the absence of money, but the absence of opportunity. And the United States is a country where you have both freedom and abundant opportunities. I'm moving to the United States as giving me both. I grew up in Lagos, Nigeria. I came from a close-knitted family. I was the third of four children. And the best thing that my parents gave me was the gift of education. Even though I came from a poor family, they gave me education with the instruction that this is the tool that will help me to dig my way out of poverty and ignorance. But what my parents did was that they instilled in us the value of faith, hard work, and not giving up. They made us realize that if you put in the work, you will definitely get the reward. I came without a dime in my pocket. All I had were big dreams, determination to succeed, and the resilience. I got my first job at the age of 14. My job was on the construction site. My duties were to move concrete on a large pan from one end of the construction site to another one. I worked on that day from around six in the morning to about seven at night. At the end of the day, the employer refused to pay me. And the reason was because she did not authorize the foreman to hire me. So I worked from sunup to sundown and didn't get paid. That tore up my spirit. And from that moment on, I decided that I was gonna become a lawyer. And I was gonna use every ounce of strength within me to fight against injustice, regardless of how powerful the opponent is. I am a man that worked my way up from nothing. I know what it means to feel like you're being unfairly treated, and I'm the person that can stand up to opponents regardless of how big or how powerful they are. Welcome to this episode of Legal Angle with Emmanuel Halawale. I have a wonderful guest with me today. She's a law professor. She's a writer. She's an academic. She's also an advocate for justice. Her name is Chris Annan. And we'll be talking about a book, The Rage of Innocence, How America Criminalizes Black Youth. Welcome to the show, Professor Hannon. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, well, I don't want to um, go down your bio because you have such voluminous things that you have accomplished in, you know, as an academic, as a person, and as a writer. Can you tell us a bit more in your own words about yourself? Yes, indeed. I, you know, have been representing children accused of delinquency for 26 years. Um, and mostly I have been representing children in the nation's capital, Washington, D.C. And it has really ignited in me a fire and a passion um, to address racial inequities in the juvenile legal system. And so, um, you know, my passions run deep. I come from a family of preachers and teachers and all of whom have been um, real vocal activists and, and, and speaking out. So I really, it's in my blood. And then also, you know, think about preachers and teachers. They care a lot about young people and um, really, working to support and promote and engage and hear the voices of young people. So that's also in my blood. And so I think that speaks to how I ended up in a career as a defense attorney for children. Thank you. And where did you grow up? So I grew up in, I was born in Nashville, Tennessee and stayed there um, through uh 
at least to the fifth grade. And then we moved to North Carolina. So I grew up in Rocky Mount, North Carolina. So I'm a, very much a product of the American South. Um, and then in Rocky Mount, North Carolina, also sort of a product of the American small town South and everything that we know in this country that that means um, that also had a defining influence on, on who I am. What was it like growing up there as a Black person? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, you know, the first time I heard the N-word was riding my bicycle in my own neighborhood. Um, so that was, you know, a pivotal moment. I think, you know, as a Black woman, you remember that moment. Um, I remember even the second time <laughs> I heard the word, uh, the N-word, and in a very powerful, um, or I should say painful context, you know, being at school um, and sitting in the classroom and somebody, you know, a classmate said, oh, you know, we almost got into a car accident, um, you know, this morning, some N, you know, almost, you know, ran us off the road. Um, you know, just speaking about a regular car accident and, you know, immediately that person immediately realized, oops, 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 I didn't mean you. And you're like, what in the world? So that's the world we live in. Um, and that's what we grow up hearing about. And what was your home life like? So I grew up with, you know, wonderful parents. My um, mother um, was a, a professor, a teacher herself, you know, early childhood education. Um, she was in, uh, she taught at Shaw University in the Rocky Mount Cape program. My father um, was a businessman. Um, and so, you know, I got to see, you know, sort of both sides uh, of that. We also were very active in, in North Carolina and Rocky Mount in our church family. Um, I was born, raised, bred as um, in the African Methodist Episcopal Church. And so we, you know, went to church. I grew up um, in youth ministry, um, vacation Bible school and so that also was very much a part of who I was. I have a very large extended family um, and we would as children go and visit our aunts and uncles and spend time with our cousins who lived in various places, you know, in the country from St. Louis, California. Um, and so very blessed in that regard to have a, a large extended family that was spread out across the, the country. So we had a lot of exposure um, and vision. We also had a family, I was raised in a family that believed wholeheartedly in education. And so I come from a family of, of um, aunts and uncles and, you know, everybody went to college, um, which, you know, isn't always the case in, you know, Southern Black uh, families, given the barriers. Um, but, you know, I was very fortunate in that regard. They, they placed a real value on education. That was great. And when did you realize that you wanted to become an attorney or what inspired you to go into that profession? Yeah, I've thought about this a lot. I, um, you know, one of my, again, because I come from a, a line of, of preachers and teachers who were just advocates, they're just always speaking out, you know, taught us about the civil rights era and we learned about, you know, um, you know, civil rights very, very early on. So I think that was embedded in my mind. But then also um, one of my earliest memories was I had an internship when I was in high school with a young uh, Black lawyer in my city. And I remember, you know, going to court and seeing um, you know, him in action. And so I think there were some formative moments like that. I didn't come from a family of lawyers by any, by any stretch. So it wasn't that, but certainly a, a family of vocal <laughs> activists and, and, and spokespersons. You came from a family of advocates and being a preacher is sometimes a form of advocacy. Absolutely. So being a lawyer is the other side That's right. of advocacy. So That's you come from that lineage. Yes, <laughs> very much so. <laughs> yes. And how did you end up being a juvenile public defender? Yeah, that's I, I'm even I'm clearer on that when my aha moment happened is um, was yet another opportunity to be in the courthouse. I was 
um, when I, a freshman in college in Durham, North Carolina, I had an apprenticeship at the local uh, prosecutor's office in juvenile court. And I will never forget the day that I showed up in um, for, you know, for the first day of the internship. And I was instructed to meet the prosecutor in a particular courtroom. And I walked into that courthouse. And just as I turned down the hall, I saw, I encountered a line full of children, a line of children who were shackled together at their legs and at their arms um, being escorted down the hallway. And there was a disproportionate representation of, of, of black and brown children in that line. And I just stopped, you know, really just dead in my tracks and just stared. I couldn't believe that we were shackling children in contemporary America. And when I got inside the courtroom, I remember saying to the prosecutor, I really want to be over there. And I was pointing to the table where the children were sitting with their defense attorney. And she said, Said, oh, you know, I'll definitely make sure I introduce you to defense counsel. And it was just such a defining moment for me. Um, that was it. I knew that was the career path that I, I wanted to pursue. And by the time I graduated from undergrad, that was an undergraduate experience, I um, applied to law schools that had a um, uh, an opportunity for their students to um, engage with young people in legal cases and um, I uh, looked for law schools that had a clinical program, really a clinical program is like an apprenticeship program. And I um, got to work in juvenile court while I was in, in law school for at least for a bit. Wow. So that was your mosaic burning bush moment. Yes, yes, and yes. This was the calling. That's it. And you heeded the call. Now, I'm um, talking about your book. Wow. Wow. Wow, that's all I can say. You know, I can't find the right word to describe this wonderful, wonderfully written, wonderfully researched book. This book is powerful. It's very, it's hard to put it down. So let's let's talk about the book itself. Yes. The the title, The Rage of Innocence, our America, our America criminalizes black youth. That is a very bold, assertive statement. Yeah. What inspired you to choose that particular title? Yeah. Because so you I don't think you have to read the book. You have an idea what the book is all about. Right. That plus the image, right? The imagery on that front cover there, right? Yes. Um, and so, you know, for me, look, the rage of innocence has a has a, a number of layers um, in terms of the meaning, but the overarching meaning is the rage that every single one of us should have. Anytime any one child is deprived of the opportunity to be a child, to have that innocent um, childhood, adolescent stage um, of development. But a more nuanced and really important aspect of that title is the rage that many Black children have when they are told over and over again that they are criminal, that they are dangerous, that they are a threat, that they are to be feared, that they are to be excluded. And any person, any child who has an ounce of self-respect, an ounce of dignity and self-worth should resist those labels, right? Those false narratives imposed upon them before they engage in any kind of, of, of conduct, um, if they ever did, right? And, um, and I say, look, the young people aren't going to say to a police officer or to a teacher or to a neighbor, you know, Mr. Officer, I don't appreciate the way you're treating me today. <laughs> Instead, they act like teenagers and they're emotional and they're reactive. And so their pushback, their resistance to those labels um, often sounds like a teenager. It sounds, you know, loud and sometimes it's maybe even has profanity in it, but it sounds like a teenager who is resisting um, and who's asserting their own dignity and self-worth. Um, and so, you know, that's a, another really important piece of that rage of innocence. And um, so, yeah. yeah. Thank you, because you are so on, 
you're, you, you're not apologizing about the point you were trying to make about the book. And you started the book with an anecdote about a Molotov cocktail and science experiment. Can you tell us that story and the importance of that story to the book? Uh, absolutely. You know, um, uh, Eric, you know, I call him Eric in the book is, is a young 13 year old that I, I wrote about or that I represented, I should say. And, you know, his story is so painful and powerful that it opens and closes the book. It's one of the most important stories in the book and definitely one of the stories that let me know that I really wanted to write this, that people should hear the stories of young people. But Eric was a 13 year old boy who um, uh, one Saturday night was watching a movie and he sees someone with a Molotov cocktail. And in his 13 year old brain, he decides he wants to make something that looks like that. He doesn't research it. He doesn't ask anybody about it. He just goes into the kitchen. He grabs a glass bottle. He grabs whatever liquids he can find, pine salt, bleach, you know, and he pours them together. Um, and he, my favorite part of the story is that he grabs a, a piece of toilet paper and he runs that toilet paper from the inside to the outside of the bottle and closes it up. Um, and we know that that toilet paper is going to burn out before it ever reaches the cap. But he tapes up the bottle so that it looks like a Molotov cocktail. But he's a kid, right? He's 13. It's Saturday night. He forgets all about it after he plays with it for a little bit, right? And he puts that Molotov cocktail, or not even, you know, he puts this bottle, right, um, in his book bag and he forgets about it. Monday morning comes and his mother drives him to school and he books his uh, book bag on the conveyor belt. Right. And a school resource officer, basically a police officer in school, sees this and asks him, what is this? To which he immediately responds, oh, that's nothing. You can just throw that away. Um, and he goes on to class. And lo and behold, um, little does he realize this is the beginning of a nine month ordeal in local juvenile court. Um, the school resource officer calls in um, the police department. They call in the fire department. They evacuate the school. They arrest him in front of his classmates. And absolutely no one will give him the benefit of the doubt when he says to them, look, that's nothing. I'm not trying to blow up the school. I forgot it was in there. He tells them all of this and nobody believes him. So, um, you know, um, and, and he when he gets arrested, he's held in detention overnight. He appears in court multiple times. And really, one of the most painful moments for me um, in my career and um, one of my another one of my aha moments is sometime after this, I am um, in Connecticut and I'm uh, giving a talk or speaking to a large you know, a group of people. And I share this story as a part of my comments. And someone comes up to me, a white woman comes up to me and she says that um, her son had done the exact same thing. Thing. And I say to her, well, what happened to him? And she says, oh, my son was placed in an advanced science class. Wow. Right. So we're going to respond by nurturing his intellectual curiosity and his his um, creativity while we punish in the most extreme ways. You know, this 13 year old black child, um, you know, who's doing the same thing. And it was such an important and powerful uh, moment uh, for me in understanding that, you know, the extraordinary differential treatment of Black children in America. We don't let Black children be children. And that was such a powerful example of that. So it was like the, you real, it made you realize that about the disappearance of innocence, even in the midst of adolescent curiosity. Right. So That's black right. children that are not allowed to be innocent. That's right. That's right. Don't even get the presumption of innocence, you know, with investigation. It's just, it's the, quite the opposite. It's the presumption of guilt and danger and threat. Yes. And you, you know, and you're the, in the forefront of it because you're a public defender defending juveniles. Right. Children, so, I like to call them. I don't even like the word juveniles because it conveys, you know, right? Mm -hmm. um, such an objective sort of um, now in particular, such a uh, pejorative commentary because it's yes. so associated with the legal system. But mm -hmm. you're right. Yeah. You know, children. defending children. Yeah, that's right. They're children. Yes. And in your profession, it's not like you are hired to defend black kids. No. But it just so happens 
that most of your clients are black. That's right. And you and wrote in the book, you know, I'll quote, she said, white, white clients are a rare sight in a public defender's office in a city like Washington, D.C. That's Why so that? true. Imagine it's worse than that. I mean, look, in 26 years, 26 years of representing children in Washington, D.C., I have only represented four white children. That's it. Every other child I have represented has been an African-American child. Every single one of us, you know, our jaws should drop. We should be outraged by that statistic. And, you know, folks who are not from Washington, D.C. might think, well, maybe, you know, there aren't many white children in the nation's capital proper or that white children don't commit crimes. I mean, let's be clear. <laughs> you know, this is a city that has plenty of white children and plenty of white children who pass through through um, the city and engage in just normal adolescent behaviors. Adolescents as a, as, a, as a demographic group are impulsive, reactive, sensation seekers, um, risk takers. They test the limits. They push the boundaries. They experiment with sex and drugs and alcohol. So what children do, and guess what? The empirical research shows that these sort of key features, developmental features of adolescents are true not only in the United States, um, but all over the world. There have been empirical studies about these key developmental um, milestones. And in fact, you know, um, this period of adolescence, this teenage years are known to be sort of the crime bump. Um, if you look at a graph, you see that um, the, the, the peak in uh, delinquent behavior or criminal behavior occurs in those adolescent years. But the question is, the key point is, how do we respond as a society? How do we label those normal adolescent uh, behaviors? And when we're talking about Black children, we label those as criminal behaviors. We're talking about kids, um, you know, white kids. We talk about them with humor. You know, we glorify them on the big screen, the Hollywood movies. They're funny. You know, you think about old movies like Ferris Bueller's Day Off or Risky Business or, um, you know, there are other, uh, you know, more contemporary movies <laughs> for you, for, for the younger audience of the ways in which we just glorify, um, you know, all the way through our early college years, right? Um, kids, you know, teenagers, growing into young adulthood, engaging in fraternities and sororities, you know, white fraternities and sororities and engaging in, you know, sexual misconduct, um, even sexual violence and um, heavy and excessive drinking and, and drugs. And we just don't respond in the same way um, to, to white children as we do to black children for the same, the exact same behaviors. Yeah, you did mention that in the book because you made a distinction between fraternities and gang. That's right. And what are the distinctions? Yeah, you know, it's it's you know fascinating if we think about it, you know, what the 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 you know governmental definition of what constitutes a gang looks a whole lot like a fraternity. You know, it's a group of young, you know, folks often in their teen years, you know, we're talking about teenage gangs, in their their teen years who hang around together <laughs> in similar clothing, right? Fraternities and sororities dress identically, um, and they engage in often um, defined as engaging in reckless and criminal behavior. Well, <laughs> if we think about, you know, a common, you know, fraternity, I've, you know, listed for you, you know, the drinking and drugs and sexual, um, you know, um, uh, improprieties that, um, you know, fraternities and um, sororities engage in, and also the hazing that is associated with fraternities um, uh, very often on college campuses. So there isn't a whole lot of difference um, at all. Um, they go by names, crew names, they have hand signals, all of those things. Absolutely true um, for fraternities and sororities of all races across the country, not just gangs. And so we have decided what we will consider gang activity um, in, in ways that are, are, are racially biased. So it's all about color, not actually about the definition of the group. That's right. That's absolutely right. And it's and I got to tell you, Emmanuel, even more, um, the the one of the federal definitions of gangs has language that excludes um, 
the uh, what should we call it? They, they it term it in different ways, but um, uh, political ideology. Um, so, in other words, um, organizations that have a white supremacist ideology, um, like the Proud Boys, has been written out of the definition of gangs, even though they are. I mean, there's beyond, you know, um, uh, you know. Compu whatever compelling evidence, point for point for point for point for point that they fit the definition of of you know gang activity, um, but yet you know by a stroke of a pen they are written out of the definition of gangs, and it's just it's it's really painful to think about the intentionality that is behind those kinds of definitions. And even when, you know, it's the, it's the folks who are on the grounds enforcing it, you know, you know, the implicit ways in which they buy into the narrative about what is a gang and what is not a gang. So it's all about targeted enforcement. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And you also told the story of Jason. Jason is your white client. Why is Jason's story unique? Well, you know, one of the reasons that Jason's story is unique is, um, as we've already indicated, I only had four white clients, four white clients. I'm still practicing four white clients in 26 years of practice. That is just I mean, it's just, you know, unheard of. And so, um, you know, um, Jason was one of my clients who really when I met him, just like an average teenager, he and his friends crash. He's a high school kid, but they crash a college fraternity party. That's what kids do. Right. And they drink alcohol and they, um, you know, of course, the college fraternity realized that they were high school kids and um, kick them out and the kids get mad. And what do they do? One of the kids um, draws graffiti. Um, outside of the building. And, and, and that graffiti um, that one of the kids drew was um, a swastika, right? And so it happened to be a Jewish fraternity and the Jewish fraternity was angry. So the prosecutor charged it as a hate crime um, because again, one of the kids had drawn a swastika um, outside. Well, here's where the story gets good, right? It's the, I got appointed, I'm at, at the time I was at the public defender service and I got appointed to represent Jason. And, um, you know, it, the, it so happens that these kids came into court on a Saturday and Saturdays are unusual because there's less judicial staff. So there was a, you know, special judge assigned to the courtroom and um, my client um, and well, actually, even before then, the, you, you, the marshals came out into the courtroom and they said to the judge, well, judge, um, I can't bring out these kids. You know, I need to bring them out two at a time because we don't have enough marshals. It's Saturday. And so for safety, we need to bring them out two at a time. And by that point, the kids, they were like, I think maybe five, I'm pretty sure there were five co-respondents, uh, five children who had been arrested and their parents were all in the courtroom. And guess what? They were all white parents, mothers and fathers. And some of them were dressed in suits. And um, the judge immediately said to the, to the marshal, oh, what are you worried about? There's no way these kids are dangerous. There's no way these kids are going to be locked up. I'm not going to keep them in detention. Look at their parents. And my mouth just dropped. I'm like, I'm the defense attorney. And of course, that's the attitude I want a judge to have in any case, um, the presumption that I'm not going to detain these kids. But I'm sitting here thinking to myself, based on what? <laughs> you know, you haven't read the charges. You have no idea what these kids have been brought in for. You know, you don't even know if they've been charged with a murder or if a rape or you have no idea. But all you see is a room full of white parents. And, you know, and I have to say, I, I you know, I, I don't reveal names in, in the in the book and I won't hear. But, you know, this is a judge who I had known for many years and was a judge who, as a general matter, was fair and impartial, I thought. Right. It was a judge who always heard from defense counsel gave them an opportunity to speak and heard from the prosecutor and allowed them to be heard. 
But he made presumptions. He made really clear judgments based upon the way the parents looked. He could relate to them. He was a white male himself, and those parents um, looked like him. And he couldn't imagine anything that these kids did. And even if they had done something dangerous, they had these good parents who were there for them. And so um, that's really, wow, what a powerful story. I, you know, Thank you for the opportunity to retell it, right? Just it has such a visceral impact in thinking about the kinds of judgments that we make. And in fact, those kids have been charged with burglary, right? Burglary, you know, into a, you know, a, a private residence, right? That's a serious felony. Now, granted, I agree, you know, as defense counsel, and I write very clearly that I thought it was, you know, silly adolescent behavior that didn't warrant prosecution at all. Um, but, you know, on, on the papers, it's a, it's a serious felony. The, the judge had racial empathy. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then, you know, in the book, you also address the uh, opio opioid um, epidemic that we're going through right now. And you wrote something that I found profound. You wrote that racism protected Black youth from the rapid increase in opioid deaths. Can you elaborate? Oh, that's so funny because there's so much to say about the, the opioid crisis. And, and, you know, just to set the foundation, what I write about um, as, a, as an initial matter is the ways in which we were so extraordinarily empathetic and still are. Um, to young people who get caught up in the opioid crisis, um, in part because the face, right, the public face of the opioid crisis among young people is a white um, and often middle class face, right? But even if sometimes it's a white rural face as well, um, not uh, you know, what we typically associate with the crack ep epidemic um, and the like. And in fact, you know, we didn't even call, you know, the, we weren't willing to call the crack um, uh, uh, phase uh, an epidemic in the sense of a, a mental health or a health crisis. Um, we spoke about the crack epidemic as a crime epidemic. Um, but your question was about the ways, the irony, the absolute yeah. irony of the fact that far less Black children, at least initially, were caught up in the opioid uh, use was in part because the much of the opioid um, epidemic started from prescription drugs, right? And so that doctors and pharmaceutical companies were pushing, you know, some variations of, of you know, opioids um, or opioid based drugs, pharmaceuticals. And but they wouldn't prescribe those to black children. Right. Um, the, the sense that uh, a couple of things, there's been some empirical research on the ways in which doctors believe that black people don't need painkillers at the same rates um, as, as other folks because they have a higher pain threshold. Again, just purely, you know, non-scientific implicit bias or pseudoscientific, I should say you know, implicit bias. And there was also some sense, um, the other way that bias worked was that doctors believed that um, Black folks would abuse, you know, opioids. So here we are, you know, refusing to give, you know, those sort of prescription meds early on, um, you know, to, to young Black folks. Um, but, you know, white folks got hooked on these prescription drugs. And then over time, they become cost prohibitive, even for a middle class family. They become cost prohibitive um, when you become addicted to a very expensive pharmaceutical drug. And then also, too, you know, as the pharmaceutical companies became under attack for, you know, writing and, and creating this, this um, opioid crisis, there's a lot of pushback. And so these addicted, you know, uh, white folks, middle class and rural folks couldn't get access to drugs. So then they turned to other forms of opioids like heroin and became addicted to heroin addiction. So it's just fascinating in the same way, you know, I, you know, writing this book, I, I went into it understanding, you know, pretty much that there was some racial disparity happening in this opioid crisis and then being able to research it and unpack it and understand how it evolved is, is it was really quite eye-opening and, and interesting to be quite frank, um, but painful, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because you, you also wrote that the fact that doctors believe that Black people can withstand more pain. That's right. So they wouldn't need those medications to alleviate the pain. That's right. Yeah. 
Is that something that is still going on, or is that something you just find out during your research? Um, you know, I, 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 I'll confess that I um, am less aware of the nuances of the contemporary mm-hmm. you know, opioid crisis. What I write about in the book is that the opioid crisis has gone through three phases, right? Um, and so, you know, as I finish the book, um, you know, and of course, you know, the, a book finishes a, a bit before it actually comes out in print, that we were in that third phase, which is this this pushback on the the, the pharmaceutical companies, but the rampant addiction, um, you know, to other street drugs as a replacement is still happening um, and still happening to white folks and to rural folks. What I don't know, so that much I do know, you know, uh, based on what I've read most recently, is whether or not the, the racial disparities where where we sit on that. Um, There was a time when um, uh, white folks were disproportionately, white teenagers and young folks were dying at disproportionately higher rates from the um, uh, opioid-related deaths than Black youth. And I'm not sure where we sit on that data point now. Thank you. And you also wrote about the criminalization of Black youth culture. Yes. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah. So with that, I mean, you know, you know, I ask folks to think about what did they care most about when they were teenagers? And I sort of invariably get, you know, answers like, you know, as a teenager, I cared about um, the clothes that I wore, the friends that I hung out with, the parties that I got invited to, the music that I listened to, the ways I styled my hair, all of those things. These are the things that teenagers care about then and today, right? Um, and but, um, but think about, right? I can pull any one of those threads and you see the different ways, the differential ways in which black children and white children are treated on those cultural markers. So think about, um, you know, music, for example, right? Um, country, um, heavy metal, pop, rock music, all these genres of music have the same sort of themes running through them, um, misogynistic themes. Um, They, in some ways, glorify violence, drugs, alcohol, um, all the things, you know, you know, sex, things that parents worry about. But yet these musical genres, you know, are applauded um, in, in, in many ways. But yet we start talking about rap music, which has the same themes, and it is treated as if it is the most dangerous music alive. Um, and there have been studies. I mean, there's a, a, another book, uh, Rap on Trial, written by um, Eric Nielsen and a friend of mine, Andrea Dennis, um, who talk about you know rap and how rap has been distorted and talk about the empirical research on the, the ways in which if you look at country, heavy metal, pop, um, you know, there are genres of music that are just as violent um, as, um, and I won't even say um, rap music is violent. It talks about political messages and black pride messages that are affirming um, as well, but we ignore that. Also think about clothing. You know, I think about the criminalization of black adolescent clothing. Um, Look at the hippie era. We think about tie-dye t-shirts and bell-bottom pants that were associated with hippies, but also also associated what with you know weed and hallucinogens. We never outlawed you know a tie dye T shirt, right? Um, think about the all black attire and the straight black hair associated with the golf um, style, and that was also associated with uh, mass killings. We never would think about criminalizing that attire. Think about steel toed Doc Martens with red shoelaces that have been um, you know self proclaimed by some supremacist groups to be one of their, you know, fashion identity markers. We have never criminalized that. But think about the one item of clothing, you know, historically um, that, you know, that we have criminalized, the sagging pants. And no, I don't want to see anybody's underwear, but is it criminal? Should it be a basis for an arrest, a stop, a frisk by a police officer? Should you be able to be incarcerated or fined um, and have a criminal record because your pants were sagging? It's a fashion style. And here's what's really important. Think about who are the most famous saggers, pants saggers, Justin Bieber, 
right? Justin Bieber, we would never consider that, you know, um, a criminal act for him, but it's on the books. It's on the books as a, cr as a crime, um, you know, in some, you know, cities and local jurisdictions. So that's something to think about. Um, and then also think about the, the hoodie, right? The hoodie is not, it's not a crime to wear a hoodie, but we all know, think about Trayvon Martin, think about all the black children walking down the street who are, um, you know, perceived to be a threat, to see, perceived to be a danger simply because they are wearing a hoodie, right? Um, and a white girl could walk down the street going to yoga class and wear a hoodie and nobody would think twice. You know, a white boy can go to football practice, wear a hoodie, nobody would think twice. And so it's really important, this notion of criminalizing um, culture, criminalizing Black adolescent culture is such an important issue. Thank you. Can you tell us about the Henry brothers? The what brothers? I'm sorry. The Henry oh, Brothers. The Henry Brothers from New York, right? So this goes back to your, your question about, you know, how we identify gangs, right? And so one of the other, it's a really good point you make about, you know, you know, teenagers care about their friends, you know, who they get to identify as friends. And so guess what? This also goes to the uh, the conversation we were having about fraternities and sororities. What did teenagers do? Remember who your best friends were and what did you all do? Guess what? I, um, uh, I dressed like my best friend when we were kids, right? I had the tackiest, most ridiculously unattractive now looking back on it. We thought we were cute then, you know, these purple pants, these lavender pants, pants and these um, lavender, you know, zip up jackets, you know, that we used to walk around in and we thought we were cute, right? Um, I can't tell you how many outfits that I've had that I dressed like my best friend. Um, and, and, you know, we hang out together. We spend the night at each other's houses. We have parties together. We sit together in the cafeteria. And, you know, you know, what do you do when you get together in a picture? You pose and you might have a sign. Um, these are all the things that teenagers do today, right? Teenagers do this. This is fun, right? And actually, guess what the research shows? That it's healthy. It's a healthy part of adolescent development to have social circles and cliques and friendships that you can identify with. It helps with self-esteem. It helps with leadership. It helps with, you know, um, relieving stress and anxiety that are so prevalent. But we criminalize those childhood friendships among Black children. And so that's what the, the, the Henry brothers, right? They lived in New York um, and they, uh, um, what do they do? Today's society is all about social media. And so they hung out as a crew, right? They hung out as a group of friends and that crew got followed. They got surveilled um, from early, very early ages. Um, and, you know, one of the brothers, I want to believe it's Jelani, um, you know, uh, and I, I have to, I apologize for not remembering the names. This, this story is actually a story from um, the newspaper, right? So not only does my book include stories from my own clients, but I also research stories um, from uh, other, you know, cities and states so I could show what was happening across America. And so these, you know, you know, young boys, you know, were followed. They were tagged by the police department, by law enforcement very early um, without their even knowing that they were being tagged. Right. And so they were um, uh, they would, you know, the law enforcement would look at their Facebook pages and um, other social media feeds and see that they were friends with other people. Right. Um, and so and maybe other people who at times engaged in some criminal conduct. And so the, the bottom line is this neighborhood crew, this neighborhood group of friends got labeled as a gang very early on. And so they could be then criminal. Once you get labeled as a gang, you could be criminally prosecuted for the acts of another person, even though you weren't involved. And so the younger brother actually went away to college. Right. He actually went away to um, to, to boarding school. Um, and he would come back right to his home neighborhood. And then he went away to college. While he's away at college, there was a murder in his hometown. And because he had been associated right with that group, not there, not you know, involved, he also got wrapped up in, in criminal charges. So this is a huge, um, you know, a huge network. Of, of surveillance around black kids. You grow up in a neighborhood and you get presumed, tagged and labeled. Even when you leave, you go away to school and you go away to college and you succeed and you're still tagged by law enforcement. 
Yeah. And you, you know, you, there was an indication in the book that kids, police were tracking kids as young as 10. Absolutely. And at some point they were tracking likes, emojis, mm -hmm. hashtags on Facebook. That's so right. In other words, even social media has become some kind of, is, has become criminalized for black youth. Absolutely. Social media, which all kids engage in now. And again, is also shown to be developmentally healthy, notwithstanding parents and teachers who worry about kids being on social media too much. That may be true, but there are, you know, demonstrated developmental benefits of engaging um, on social media. Hmm. And when it also comes to the virtue of white women and black youth, you told the story of Jeremiah Harvey. Right and the connection to Emma Till. Yeah, absolutely. So for those of you who don't you know, know this story, you should look it up. It's a story of um, Jeremiah Harvey. I believe he was, ooh, I'm going to, uh, was, was he nine? Was nine? nine? Yeah, he was nine. nine years old at the time. He's walking in a bodega, you know, in Brooklyn, and he, he's walking in with his mother and his little sister, and um, he has a book bag on his back and he just walks in the bodega there's a woman standing a white woman standing at the counter and his book bag accidentally brushes against her behind and um he doesn't even realize it he just you know is walking and she turns around and she sees him and she automatically assumes that he touched her on purpose for sexual gratification. How absurd is that, right? To turn around and believe that this nine-year-old has somehow like, you know, touched you sexually, right? And um, and so she threatens to call the police. And in fact, she does call the police and she's standing outside making this call. And the, you know, people who are watching this are absolutely outraged. People are yelling at her and berating her. Are you kidding me? Are you calling the police on this nine-year-old child? And, you know, even a white woman is watching her saying, you've got to be kidding me. Um, and so, you know, everybody's protesting and, you know, yelling at her. And she um, ultimately asks um, to see the, the video, like she's, you know, yelling into the phone and um, to the police, but then later asks to see the video camera footage from the bodega and realizes that this kid has just walked in the store, didn't even look at her and has brushed her with a, um, you know, with his book bag. And so she apologizes publicly, but the damage has been done. I mean, this is a nine-year-old child who is traumatized, you know, Emmanuel, on so many ways. He's crying hysterically. His sister is crying hysterically. They don't understand what has happened. They don't even understand why the police have been called. They mistakenly um, assume because they can hear her yelling at, um, of course, their mother got outraged. And so she's, you know, yelling at the, you know, at the woman and they get into a yelling match. And so they're terrified that their mother is about to be arrested for getting into a verbal argument with this, this, this um, woman. They're not even even realizing, you know, what she's, what she has accused. Um, and it went viral and he got the nine-year-old and his mom, Jeremiah, you know, went on television. They were on, I believe on Good Morning America. They were on several um, um, outlets. And, you know, even then, like days later, he's still crying crying as he tells the story and telling how his mother, I'm almost, you know, getting emotional, you know, just retelling that story, but he's, he's telling the audience, the TV audience about how his mother had to tell him, had to teach him about Emmett Till. Right. And, you know, it was a story at that age of nine that he didn't know. So imagine what it means to be a black mother who has to teach your nine year old child about false accusations um, of, of sexual um, impropriety at the age of nine. It's just, you know, unbearably painful. And I just don't think people realize how extraordinarily traumatic um, a moment like that was a moment in time was, and it's, you know, just indelibly marked um, on his heart and his mind, you know, probably for the rest of his life. It's, it's, uncon it's unconscionable. It really is. Yeah. And then what is black sex talk? 
Oh, right. You know, so we talk about the, you know, the talk. A lot of us have heard the talk. It's the talk itself is what Black parents have to, you know, to to give to their children. You have to tell your your children to, um, you know, when they see and they encounter police, they're a risk. You know, put your hands up, comply with the police, do whatever they say. That's the regular talk. The Black sex talk is the, is the talk that Black parents, um, you know, also have to give their their children um, to, to tell them, hey, look, if you engage in, this is really sad, in interracial, you know, consensual interracial sexual encounters, right, which you lawfully are entitled to do, <laughs> um, but you need to know that there is a risk, that you might well be falsely accused, that you might be misinterpreted, that a white parent might get upset with their child for engaging in interracial sexual encounters. And then, you know, that leads to some prosecution or false accusation. And so, you know, we, we have many stories like that. Marcus Dixon, folks will remember an older story from, from Georgia. You know, he's a, you know, um, he's now, you know, became, he went on to become a famous football player, but he spent time in jail because he had consensual sex. And even the jury agreed that there was consensual sex between him and a white girl, you know, and, you know, um, Georgia law allowed them to prosecute that case because there was, a, I believe, a two year age difference between her or, you know, or even it was a, even one or two year age difference. Um, I write about 17. She was 16. That's right. One year age difference. Right. Um, but that was enough under Georgia law at the time. The law has since been rewritten. Um, but, you know, because of this case, but that allowed for statutory rape. Um, and so, you know, look, you know, they brought the charges, prosecuted him, um, and he went to jail. He went to prison. He originally got a 10-year prison sentence, you know, for consensual sex with a, um, with a, a, a child, with a classmate who was a white female classmate, one year young, younger than him. Um, and, you know, of course, the, you know, the country was outraged. Many people were outraged by it. And, a lawyer um, uh, voluntarily at a law firm took on his case and represented him and got that conviction overturned. And again, he went on, he at the time was a, 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 a star, an absolute star football player. He had a scholarship to um, a prestigious college to play football and he went to prison. And, um, you know, fortunately when he got out, he was able to rebound, went to another college and then went on to play pro ball. Yeah, you know, we, you know, that's just a story that ended up, you know, uh, happy ending. Most yeah. of those stories may not end up like that. Oh, the vast majority of stories do not get rectified in that way. Vast majority majorities of stories like Jeremiah Harvey don't get rectified with an apology. Um, they just don't. Um, I, you know, we represent kids who go to jail um, deeply rooted in implicit racial bias. You know, you think about the Jenna Six, um, folks who remember that, you know, out of Louisiana, you know, six, you know, um, black kids who got arrested, you know, and, and spent time in prison. And some of those kids, you know, um, you know, are suffering. Actually, one uh, is doing really, really quite well. He's a lawyer. He's a defense attorney. Um, he's doing quite well. But not everybody um, was able to rebound from from that prosecution either. Yeah. Because you also mentioned the story of the Central Park Five oh, yeah. and how black youth get criminalized for being boys. Absolutely. Playing in a park, by the way, right? Those kids, you know, and it's so fun. Not even all the kids were at the park, right? Or not even all the kids were involved um, who got of those of the now exonerated five. But, you know, it's a story about, you know, out of New York, folks know this story, right? Go, you know, one night, group of kids being teenagers, tons and tons of children out, you know, playing and, and, and you know, having a good time on a summer night. And, um, you know, first of all, the first, you know, sign of problem is that that behavior was labeled as wilding. Those kids were were labeled and identified and equated with wild animals. Um, but unfortunately, ever so extraordinarily, tragically, some um, a, a woman, you know, Trisha Miley was raped, um, you know, brutally raped in that park. Um, but she was not raped by um, that group of black and brown children who were playing in the park that night, not at all, but yet um, they were zeroed in on, they were arrested, they were interrogated, you know, viciously. 
um, even when the, the physical evidence didn't match um, their, their supposed confessions that, you know, were extracted after hours and hours of interrogation late at night without their parents, notwithstanding, you know, some of them without their parents, notwithstanding, you know, um, New York law. Um, one of them, Yusuf Salam's, you know, parents, you know, weren't in, you know, mother wasn't in the interrogation because they kept saying he was older than he actually was. And even when the parents were there um, in the room, the, the, the um, police officers manipulated the parents in various ways, either into leaving the room or to getting their kids to confess to a crime that they didn't commit. Um, and those, those kids spent years, years in prison, some of which were in solitary confinement. It's just so tragic. It is very tragic. And, you know, this book is packed with a lot of anecdotes, a lot of information, and a lot of stories that you can't read this book and not see it the way it is. Right. So what was your writing process? Yeah, so um, uh, very much it was about um, my wanting to give voice to this, you know, and I, when I started out, you know, definitely I knew that Eric, you know, the client that I write about, I call him Eric in the book, was an anchoring story. And there were a couple of anchoring stories that I wanted to write about. But what I wanted to do was to, to take those stories and to research, you know, to help people really understand why did this happen? Why did this young person get arrested in the first place and then um, and criminalized? And once they did get arrested and criminalized, what was that trauma like? And so I did a lot of research and what is, you know, um, but I wanted to tell that in a way that was exciting accessible to uh, a mass audience, to, you know, an everyday person. And when I started writing that book, look, I'm a law professor, I'm a lawyer, um, and I've got that academic speak. And so, you know, I would let people, friends of mine, um, you know, good friends of mine, read little excerpts from the book, and they'd be like, mm, you know, that sounded a little legalistic. You said you wanted to write a book for the mass audience. You're going to need to to tell this differently. And so um, I began to like build, you know, uh, or just identify more stories. And it turns out, Emmanuel, that over the course of my career, I had been compiling or collecting, um, let's say, police reports or um, pleadings from what I call my shock and all cases, cases that should really anger and outrage everybody. And I didn't even realize I was keeping these and I wasn't keeping them because I knew I wanted to write a book. I was just keeping them. And early in my career, I was keeping them in paper copy. And then now um, they're on my computer in electronic form. And so when I realized that I needed to like, you know, tell more stories and this book should be anchored in those stories, I went back and I read um, those. And I have to tell you, it was traumatizing just reading them. And I thought about, if this is what I'm experiencing secondarily, post, you know, secondary trauma, um, then imagine how much more traumatic these stories were to my clients and to their families while they're happening. And so I would read those stories and I would write about them and research about them. And the more I researched, the more stories I remembered from my, from my work and more stories I remembered from, you know, what we see in the news and on the television. And I dug deeper and I, I just learned more about those stories and even the high profile stories that a lot of us know about Tamir Rice, Mike Brown, Eric Garner, um, you know, Trayvon Martin, Jordan Davis, I mean, the names, Jeremiah Harvey, what I did with a lot of those stories is read more, right? And, and look at interviews with parents and um, uh, children to really understand what was happening. So I learned more about those stories than I ever knew um, from our initial, you know, reporting about those. So that's really what the, the process was like. So what do you want the reader to take away from this wonderfully written book? Yeah. So I want folks to everyone to know that, you know, black children are children, too. And that is the ultimate message. And, you know, chapter 12 ends with, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, I don't want to call them solutions. We've got a long way to go and there's no sort of canned solutions for this problem, but I have ideas. I offer ideas and ways of thinking about how do we as a country alter the narrative that we have about Black children? How do we 
um, uh, move the needle forward and radically reduce the footprint of law enforcement, all kinds of law enforcement in the lives of all children, but especially black and brown children who have just been disproportionately um, prosecuted. And I say, yes, I talk about policing in this book, but this is by no means a book solely about policing. It's about all the ways all of us criminalize black children, whether it's in the school system, in the community, in the mental health space, right? The ways in which we see aggressive, you know, behaviors um, by children who have been traumatized. We see that as criminal responses instead of trauma responses. When it's a white child who are experiencing trauma, we want to give them treatment. We're understanding. We don't send them to jail um, for their trauma responses. And so this is what I want. I want to change the narrative. I want everybody to read this book, to see themselves in these stories, what they did when they were teenagers and never ended up in jail. I want them to see their own children in these stories and see how their children never ended up in jail. And then ask that critical question, how can I make a difference? How can I support Black children um, in in my own community? Can I give them, you know, an internship, a job? Can I mentor? Can I tutor? Um, Can I, you know, pay attention to local politics um, so that we are electing the right judges and the right prosecutors um, who are going to work on, um, you know, closing the door, the juvenile court door, um, such that we're only sending children, um, you know, to court on the absolute most serious of serious offenses. And even then, you know, we do so with empathy and compassion and rehabilitation and guidance and redirection, which is exactly what we do when a white child commits a serious crime. Thank you. And where can people get the book? Um, you can get this book anywhere that um, uh, anywhere books are sold. Literally, people say that all the time, but it's true. You know, um, if you want to go to independent book buyer, you can do that. But you can also get it from um, you know the big box stores, Amazon, and um, uh, and the like. Uh, if you go to uh, rageofinnocence.com. Uh, that's a, a website where I have more about the book and where you can purchase it. The book was um, published by Penguin Random House, Pantheon at Penguin Random House. So you can also buy it directly from the publisher. Thank you. And how can people reach you? So you can reach me. I'm a professor at Georgetown Law School, so I'm very easy to find. Uh, You can find me. I am the director of the Juvenile Justice Clinic and Initiative at Georgetown Law School. And you can find my email address. You can reach out directly to me um, uh, through the through Georgetown's website and look and see all of the racial justice work that we're doing um, at at the Juvenile Justice Clinic at Georgetown. You also can find me. um, uh, There are links to find me through uh, Rage of innocence.com. Thank you. And thank you for you know, joining us today and for educating the public for over an hour. Ah, so, what does it mean to you to come on this show to educate the public? Oh, you know, I, I'm honored that you would invite me. I, you know, uh, heard your story in the intro and, you know, the ways in which we come, you know, uh, you know, from Nigeria to this country expecting uh, to be treated, you know, with equity and with respect and humanity and dignity. And yet you come and very often young teenagers who come um, with black skin and brown skin, you know, don't get those opportunities. So it's an honor to be here with you um, and to hear your story and your story of, of um, success and resilience and, and just, you know, be able to talk about ways in which we can create that opportunity for all um, uh, folks who look like you and me. Thank you. It's an honor to have you on the show, too, and to be having this conversation with you. I truly appreciate your time, and I hope that you'll come back on the show because there's so much to unpack from this book and all the work that you've done in the past and what you continue to do. Thank you again for coming on to Legal Angle. All right. Thank you so much. And thank you for all you do, creating the opportunity for these spaces uh, and, you know, these, uh, these conversations. So thank you. Thank you. And for those of you watching us at home or listening to this as a podcast, we thank you for your time. And until next time, stay blessed. Bye for now.